mind this morning so that you can change us by the power of your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Everybody sit. Amen. We're doing a study right now all the way through verse by verse through the book of Galatians. This morning we're going to come to Galatians 4 verses 21 through 31. We're going to get a pretty good chunk this morning and finish up uh, chapter number 4. But I want to remind you because it actually is going to tie back in uh, to what we're going to talk about as our application for the day. And so I want to take just a minute and remind you why we study books of the Bible this way, why we study through books of the Bible verse by verse, because it would certainly uh, be easier just to go through and uh, kind of cherry pick the things that we want to talk about, the things that are comfortable to talk about, the things that are fun to talk about. It'd be a lot easier to develop a sermon series that way or a message series in that way. So why do we study all the way through verse by verse through books of the Bible? And the reason is very simple because the Bible tells us that all of God's word, every single word, is God-breathed. That every word is good for uh, training us and for teaching us and for correcting us and for rebuking us and doing all of that stuff in righteousness, that all of God's word is good for that. So when we study systematically through books of the Bible, we don't miss some really good stuff that God has for us, because if we weren't studying this way and we were just bouncing around, we would miss some application uh, that the Holy Spirit had intended for us. Plus, if someone sat down and they wrote you a letter, and they sent it to you and you opened it up, well, you wouldn't read the first paragraph and then skip the second one and go over to the third one and then read the last paragraph and then maybe come back and get the second one and never read the fourth one right you would pick the letter up and how would you read it you would read it in the way that they wrote it to you because you would be thinking that there was some intention or some reason behind why they wrote the letter in that way well I can guarantee you that especially as we talk about the uh, epistles and the letters that Paul wrote to the churches, there was intention behind the way that he wrote uh, these books or these letters the way that he did, and we want to make sure that we capture all of that. It's important for us to learn how to study and understand God's Word for ourselves. This is important for you. As a follower of Christ, you have to learn how to study the Bible for yourself. And the good news is, if I can do it, I know you can. You can understand. You're looking at me like you're not sure if that's true or not. You can understand God's word for yourself. I don't want to put myself out of a job or anything, but you don't need me to tell you what God has to say for you. You can find out all on your own what God has to say for you because he wrote you the same letter that he wrote me and we all have access to it. Everybody in the room today has access to a Bible because we've got them on our phone. We have free apps and if you don't have a smartphone where you can download an app and you don't have a Bible, come see me after and I'll put one in your hand before you leave today. We all have access to the word of God. You can Read, study, and understand and apply God's Word to your life on your own. So today, we're, we're going to focus on what Paul says, but we're not going to only focus on what Paul says. We're actually going to focus mostly in our application today on how Paul says what he says. Because how many of you know that you can say the same thing, but you can say it two different ways, and it means two completely different things. How you say something matters, okay? Danica can come up to me and be like, baby, I love you so much. And I'm like, hey, hey. I feel loved. But you know what? There has actually been times in our relationship, and I was trying to decide how far I wanted to ride this train, there's actually been times in our relationship where she said the words, I love you, but what she meant was, go away. You know what I'm saying? I love you, but leave. It was kind of like that. The same words, but a completely different message. Why? Because of how she said it. And so today, we're going to look at how 
Paul says what he says, as well as uh, the words that he says. So let's do it. Galatians 4, like I said, we got a pretty good chunk of scripture today. We're going to look at verses 21 through 31, but it all goes uh, together, so we don't want to break it apart. This, is, this section goes together. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and the other by a free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as the result of a divine promise. These things are being taken figuratively. The, woman, the women <coughs> represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother, for it is written, Be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child, shout for joy and cry aloud, you who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Verse number 28. Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. It is the same now. That's an important part right there. It is the same now. But what does Scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. So let's go through and break it down. And again, we're really going to look at how Paul says what he says this morning at the end. Verse number 21 says, Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law Says So that really begs the question, who would actually want to live under the law? If these two things are opposed, you can either live under the law or you can live under grace. And to these churches, to these people in this region of Galatia, this is what has been offered to them. They knew the law. They understood the law. Most of them were non-Jews, but they understood what the law of Moses was they were intimately familiar with the law. And then Paul comes along and he offers them grace and he offers them freedom through Jesus. And now he says, you get to choose. So who would want to live under the law? It's actually a really natural place for us to find ourselves is under the law and living a life of legalism. And really it's for three reasons. One, if you're living under the law and you're trying to follow a legalistic way to find righteousness and a legalistic way to find your place with God, if you're living under the law, then you always have a list of rules that you can follow. I'm a list guy. Is there anybody else who's a list person? You like a list? I love a good checklist. There's almost nothing better than getting to the end of the day and checking off everything that there was to do on your checklist. Now, I don't always make it to the end of my uh, checklist. In fact, this morning, I have my checklist on my phone, but this morning, uh, I had to go back and check off some things that I was supposed to do yesterday and that I was supposed to do even the day before that. So I don't always get through my list, but I love a good checklist. And it would be so easy for me to do the same thing with my spiritual life and just make a checklist of all the things. If I can just do these things, then I'm going to feel really good about where I am with Jesus this week. Number one, wake up and pray in the mornings for at least five minutes. Check. And get the boys out of the house without screaming at them so I feel like I'm a good parent. Check. That's spiritual, right? Raise your kids up in the way that they should go. I'm going to raise them not to yell at each other. Check that off. Read the Bible for 10 minutes. I got seven minutes this morning, so I'll give myself three quarters of a check. But I still feel pretty good about that. And we can go through this list of things that can make us feel good about who we are and us to feel good about our right standing with God, not because of what God has done for us, but because of what we are doing for 
God. If you're following this legalistic pattern, then you can always have a checklist, and that's appealing to people. The second reason is that you get to feel good about yourself because you can keep your rules better than some other people can keep your rules. Oh, we're having fun now. See, it's so funny that people who make a spiritual checklist, what they put on the checklist is always things that they're really good at. Oh, they don't want to talk about that. See, we never put the things that we struggle with on our spiritual checklist, because if we did, then we would have to admit that we don't need to be doing a spiritual checklist. Okay, let me get back to my notes. You get to feel good about yourself because you can keep the law better than some others. The problem with that is that while that may be true, and maybe you're better than some other people, it's also true that there are plenty of people who are better than you. There are plenty of people who would be better at keeping the law than me. And if our right standing and our closeness to God was predicated completely on how we kept this list of rules, I would never be able to find intimacy with God because there's always somebody who's going to be a little bit better than I am. The third reason, though, that it's appealing is that you get the credit for earning your way to God. You get the credit. You get to feel good about yourself for earning your way to God. I love the phrasing here. It says that you are under the law like the law is the lord of your life and if you're living a life that's prescribed by legalism that's exactly what it is the law has become your lord instead of god being your lord the law of god has become your lord you're being dominated and controlled by the law as opposed to being under grace doesn't that sound so much better being under grace, being covered by grace, instead of being smushed and crammed by the law. Under the law, it is what you do for God that gives you relationship with Him. Hear this. Under the law, it is what you do with God that gives you relationship with Him. Under grace, it is what God has done for you that gives you relationship with Him. Two completely different things. Under grace, it is what God has done for us that gives us right standing with Him. So, while it's tempting to live under the law, Christians don't belong there. We belong under grace. And what Paul is about to do is he's saying, hey, don't you know what the law actually is? He's saying, don't you know what the Bible actually says? And he's about to take them back to what we know as Genesis chapter number 16 and give them a story about Abraham. And that's where he picks up in verse number 22. For it is written, that's in scripture, it is written in the law that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as a result of a divine promise so Abraham or so Paul sets Abraham up as the example here and he does that for two reasons one is that everyone in the churches that he was talking to everyone knew that Abraham was the father of our faith and two the the Judaizers or the, the false teaching Jews were invoking their connection to Abraham <coughs> that they were descendants of Abraham, they were invoking this as proof of their point. One son, he says, was born according to the flesh, that's Ishmael, and he's going to represent legalism, and one was born according to the spirit, according to the promise of God, and that is Isaac, and Isaac is going to represent, again, the promise. Something that we can't just let pass by here is that phrase, born according to the flesh. Born how? According to the flesh. You can either be born according to the flesh or born according to the spirit. And Paul says that legalism is birth according to the flesh. It's trying to make a way to God in our own flesh. One scholar said legalism does not mean the setting of spiritual standards. 
It means worshiping these standards and thinking that we are spiritual because we obey them. It also means judging other believers on the basis of these standards. See, we've done a lot of talk about grace over the last few months, and we're going to continue to talk about grace here in a few weeks. <clears throat> Paul's going to kind of get into uh, some works talk and what happens after we have the foundation of grace. We've done a lot of talk about grace, and we've done a lot of talk about how works isn't the way to God, and that's absolutely true. Works will never be the way to God, but works will always be, or I should say works will always follow grace. They work in tandem. They're not opposed to each other. Works will always follow grace. We should have really high spiritual standards. The difference is why we have the standards. Legalism sets standards to glorify ourselves when we keep them, and believers should set standards to glorify God when we keep them. Let's keep going. Verse number 24 and 25. These things are being taken figuratively. The woman, the women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are slaves. This is Hagar. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. Now, without spending a great amount of time uh, in the book of Genesis, uh, actually doing Bible study this morning, Hagar was the slave of Abraham's wife, Sarah. Hagar had a son by Abraham, and they named him Ishmael, but he was not the promised son of God. Abraham and Sarah got out of the will of God. They tried to help God along. They, it wasn't happening in their timing, and so Abraham and Sarah devised their own plan. They said, hey, God gave us this promise that we were going to have a son, but there's no son coming. We don't actually believe that God's going to deliver on his promise, so we're going to help God deliver on his promise. And do you know what it caused? A great big mess. This should be a lesson to all of us this morning. If God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. But he's going to do it in his timing and not in our timing. And when we try to rush the timing of God, do you know what we create? A great big mess. And that's exactly what happens in, uh, in this story. They try to help God along, and it causes all kinds of of problems. Now, the reference here to Mount Sinai is a direct reference to the law of Moses. It was on Sinai that Moses received the law from God. But this law has now enslaved the children of God who are living under it. Right? Let's go back and read it. This covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are there to be slaves. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds, get this, to the present city, Jerusalem. That means the here on earth city of Jerusalem. And this is going to stand in contrast to something that we talk about here in just a minute. This is directed at the Judaizers. They were claiming that they were Abraham's descendants, so they knew best. And Paul is saying they are Abraham's descendants. See, they were saying, hey, we're going to be the back to the Bible group. Like Paul came in and he gave you some stuff that you can't find in Old Testament scripture. So let's get back to Old Testament scripture. This is how it goes. And Paul says, hey, they are sons of Abraham. What they're telling you about that part of the Old Testament scripture is true, but they're twisting the scripture in a way that's not actually right anymore. So Paul comes back and says, this is what the scripture actually means. It's directed directly at the Judaizers. They're Abraham's descendants, but they are bound in slavery like Ishmael instead of being children of the promise of God like Isaac. Verse number 26, but the Jerusalem that is above is free and she is our mother for it is written, be glad barren woman, you who never bore a child, shout for joy and cry aloud, you who are never in labor because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. The Jerusalem above, verse number 26, the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. Again, without going uh, too deep into the weeds and just spending a lot of time 
doing a Bible study on Genesis 16, I want to make clear today what the Jerusalem from above is. Because that's one of those things that, if we're not really careful, it just sounds like some kind of lofty, pretty biblical language. And if we're not actually paying attention to what it means, we just kind of pass over that and skip it. And if we asked everybody in the room today, hey, write down right now what the Jerusalem from above is. We'd probably get a lot of different answers. And so we want to make sure that we're all coming from uh, the same place and that we understand what that actually means means it's very significant the jerusalem that is above is actually referring to the new jerusalem the jerusalem that is above is referring to heaven <clears throat> so paul is saying hey the slave woman that covenant came from where we talked about it in the last section came from mount sinai that's a place on earth you can actually go to mount sinai it came through a man from a place on earth that is the covenant of the law and he's contrasting that with the covenant of grace by saying this covenant of grace came from not the earthly jerusalem but from the new jerusalem this covenant of grace came through jesus christ and it came from heaven so one came through man on earth one came through god from heaven now pick one of the two places See, what the Galatians were getting was only one side of the story. They were getting the bondage side only, not the freedom in Jesus Christ side. Verse number 28, we've got to move on. Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of the promise. This is probably uh, the best one line in all of the scripture that we have today, that we are children of the promise of God. Paul is speaking mostly to non-Jews here. Gentiles were not a part of the original covenant with God. So for someone who was not born a Jew to come into right relationship with God during this time, they had to completely convert to Judaism. And there was a lot of physical rituals that they had to go through to convert over to being Jews. This is what the false teaching Jews, who we've been calling the Judaizers, this is what they were still trying to place on the Gentiles, that you still have to become a Jew. You still have to follow the law if you want relationship with Jesus. And Paul is saying, hey, I'm telling you, based on the story and the promise of Abraham, that that is not true. You, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of the promise. They are the promised children of Abraham. Remember several weeks ago, we, we talked about the promise of Abraham. And what was that promise? It was that God was going to bless the nations. He was going to bless the entire world through the seed of Abraham. The seed, talking about Jesus Christ. And so Paul is saying, hey, it's not just for the Jews anymore. For the Gentiles, you are the promise of Abraham. This is good news for us. As far as I know, there aren't any Jews here this morning. We're all Gentiles. And unless God made a way for us to come into right relationship through Jesus, we could not be in relationship with God like we are today. We are children of the promise. Paul is saying, be sure not to do what Abraham and Sarah did and try to add to the promise and the plan and the timing of God. God will take care of you in his timing. God will take care of you in his way. And in fact, God has already taken care of you spiritually when he sent Jesus to die on a cross for your sins. You don't need to become a Jew. Why? You are a child of promise. Let's finish up, verse 29 through 31. At that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the spirit. It is the same now. Now in the Bible story, that actually happened. So, and they would have known all of this. Ishmael began kind of picking on and tormenting Isaac. So the son who was born outside of the promise of God started uh, picking at and messing with the son that was born in the promise and that's what paul's talking about here by the power of the spirit and then he says it is the same 
now. This is a direct shot at the false teaching Jews. So let's finish reading. But what the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. Again, this is a direct shot at the false teaching uh, Jews. Paul compares them to Hagar and to Ishmael. He says that they are persecuting the church. That's what he says. It is the same now. They're persecuting the church. Scripture says that they should be put out. Paul is saying you need to put these people out before they steal your inheritance and they replace it with the chains of bondage of the law that they are choosing to wear. So Paul does this little Bible study here, and that's what we're going to talk about, not just what Paul said, because we talked about what Paul said, and what Paul said is certainly important, but how he chose to say that is, uh, I think, a really important uh, takeaway for us today. The false teaching Jews were using scripture, but they were using it in a wrong way. They were using it to twist the meaning of scripture. Paul comes along in this section and makes sure that the churches in the region of Galatia knew that what he was saying and the grace that he had given them and the promise that he had given them was coming directly from scripture and that he was handling it the right way. So here's our challenge for today. We started today talking about uh, why we study through books of the Bible systematically like we do, and that wasn't an accident. It's directly tied to Paul's teaching for today. We have to study and know the Word of God. It sounds so basic, but I, I would guess that everybody in the room wouldn't want to recount how many times that they've deeply studied the Word of God in the last month. I'm not talking about read it. I'm not talking about a spiritual checklist. It got so quiet. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands or anything. Relax. How many times we actually deeply studied the Word of God? We have to know and understand the word of God. A couple of takeaways from what Paul said. It should be the standard for believers that we know and understand basic biblical principles. In this letter, Paul did not go back and explain all of Genesis 16 to them. Why? Because he knew that they knew what Genesis 16 said. He knew that they knew the basic foundational biblical principles. He knew whenever he started talking about the two sons of Abraham, that everybody in the room was going to know who the two sons of Abraham were. Everybody in the room was going to know the story and be able to take his application, because that's what he was doing. He said earlier in the story, that this wasn't meant to be literal. They weren't act, this isn't actually where the two different covenants came from. He knew that. He was using it as an illustration. The only way he could do that is if he was so confident that all the people in the room were going to know what the Bible said. The truth is, we're living in the most biblical, illiterate generation that has ever existed. Here's what happened, though. We'll, we'll go there for just a second. Here's what happened. Not in an altogether bad way, but there used to be uh, this thing in church called Sunday school, right? Who, who was raised in Sunday school? If you were raised in church, you were raised in Sunday school. Okay. And so what used to happen was that parents would bring their children to Sunday school and they would put them in these rooms with these teachers, and the parents would go to their Sunday school class, and that's where children got their biblical education. 
And so we stop doing Sunday school, we abandon Sunday school for other pursuits that are fine things. I'm not advocating bringing Sunday school back, but what happened was it actually uh, exposed a critical flaw in the Christian home. And it was that just like our children's uh, education in the world, a lot of times that gets farmed out, right? We send our kids to school and we farm out their education. Just like we farm out their education, we were also farming out their biblical education. And when the church wasn't teaching our kids the basic biblical stories and foundational principles of God's word anymore. When that went away, all of the biblical education went away. And it may sound a little self-serving to say, but it is not my responsibility to educate your kids on what the word of God says for their life. It isn't Pastor Brad's responsibility It's our responsibility to equip you to do that, certainly. But if the only biblical education that your kids ever get is from me or from Pastor Brad, they're going to come up lacking. I know that it isn't my responsibility because God didn't give me your kids, He gave me my kids. It's not your responsibility to make sure that my kids are well-versed in Scripture and know what God says for them and the promises of God for their lives. And it isn't my responsibility to make sure that that's happening with your kids. We, we have to know and understand basic biblical principles. And you know where that starts? It starts in the home. I have so much to say about that. I probably shouldn't. I never remember a time where uh, there was a lot of prayer and Bible and stuff like that in the school system. That was gone before, before I came along. And every now and then there will be this big push from the Christian community. We need to get prayers back in the school. Hey, I'm all for it. Show me the petition. I'll sign it. I'm all for it. But before we make a really big, huge push to get God back in the schools, maybe we should put him back in the home. Who, who legislated that God had to, that Bible study had to come out of the home? As far as I know, Monty, is this, nope, that's not a law, right? Okay, just making sure with our legislator in the back. It's actually not a law. We just stopped it. We have to know and understand and teach the next generation basic biblical principles. The second thing that we can see from how Paul says what he says today is that we have to be able to rightly divide it's a King James phrase we have to be able to rightly divide the word of God in Paul's uh, second letter to Timothy he says do your best to present yourself to God as one approved a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of God that's the NIV version the King James Version says, and rightly divides. He wanted to make sure that Timothy knew how to rightly divide the Word of God. That means to correctly handle the Word of God. In this section, Paul is giving Timothy some really practical advice about how to lead and how to live. And one of the things that he says is foundational to Timothy's walk with Jesus is that he knows how to handle the Word of God. Not that he knows the Word of God. That comes before this. You have to know the Word of God, but you also have to know how to handle the Word of God, how to rightly divide what is right and what is wrong. He knows the Word of God and how to handle it. It's not just enough to have some scriptures memorized. It's not just enough to have a Bible 
on the end table at home. It's not just enough to have the Bible app downloaded onto our phones. We have to know how to handle the Word of God. Because I guarantee you, the enemy knows how to mishandle the Word of God. We can see it whenever he tempted Jesus. Matthew 4, verses 5 through 7. Then the devil took him to the holy city. This is Jesus. To stand on the highest point of the temple. And the enemy, the devil, says, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. And then what does he say? For it is written... He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. What does he do? He quoted scripture at Jesus. Which is so crazy because he tried to use the word against the word, and that'll never work. But what does Jesus do? Jesus answers him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So what was happening in that moment was the enemy was trying to take Holy Scripture and twist it and use it as a deception. But Jesus knew what? He didn't just know the Word. He knew how to handle the Word. He knew how to rightly divide the Word. Not only do we have to have basic understanding of of biblical principles we also know we have to know how to rightly divide and handle the word of god two things that we can take away and apply to our life grow more in scripture and study so that you know how to handle the word of god here's my challenge to you this week actually it's going to be for the entire month i want you to study god's word every day with your family for one month not alone with someone else so if you're single then find somebody else who's single and study with them every day for a month you'll be best friends in 30 days husband and wife if you're studying separately that's fine you can keep doing your own thing But for the next month, I also want you to read and study together. Whatever you want. As long as it's God's word and you're systematically going through it. So pick a book that you're both interested in and for the next 30 days, go through that book together. It'll be great for your marriage. Be fantastic for your relationship. If you have kids, make sure that your kids are there. Man, when we first started reading with Judah... I would, I would want to throw my Bible by the end of it. Not out of happiness. Because he just couldn't stop talking. I'm like, son, I'm trying to read. And I'd get like a sentence in, and he'd yell something, or get up and run around the table. But you know what? It's worth it. Put in the time. It's worth it. This is the challenge. Read and study with your family with your spouse, with your kids, if they're still living at home, for one month. Why? Because we're going to take the Word of God that we've learned today, and we're not just going to be hearers, but we're going to be doers. We're going to be people who apply the Word of God to our lives. One more time, two things that we can take away from how Paul said what he said today. One, it was just understood that the people in the churches that Paul started knew the Bible. It was understood that they were going to know the story that he was talking about. And number two, so that we're not deceived, like the Galatian churches were being deceived, not only do we have to know the word, we have to know how to handle the word. We have to know how to rightly divide the word. We're going to do that through study for the next month. Will you guys stand with me? God, you're good in everything. You're perfect in all of your ways. God, we've opened your word this morning. And I pray that it causes us to change. I pray that it transforms us. I pray.
that we're not just hearers, but we're doers of your word, God. Lord, there's some times where we feel like we ask ourselves why we're not hearing from you. Like you're being silent. And in those times, God, I pray that we remember that you have communicated with us, that we can always communicate with you, that we can always hear from you. Even when it feels like we're not being heard, in those moments where it feels like our prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling and they're coming back down to us, Lord, remind us, even when we feel like we're not being heard, remind us that we can always hear from you, and that's more important. It's more important, God, for my life that I hear from you than you hear from me. In those moments, God, bring me back to your word. Lord, I pray that biblical study is something that is and becomes normal in our families. That we study together, that we pray together, that we raise our children, that we raise our children in your word. God, I pray for the emotional and spiritual strength that that will take. With nobody looking around for just a moment, if you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, today would be a great day for that. We'd love to pray with you this morning. We'd love to get some material in your hand about what it means to be a lifelong follower of Jesus. If that's you, believers are praying right now. If that's you, we just slip your hand up. We're not going to embarrass you this morning. We're not going to call you out again. After service, we just want to pray with you. Connect you with somebody and, and some materials. Everybody can look at me this morning then. Pastor Chris and the team are going to lead us uh, here in just a moment. and We'll end in a time of worship like we do uh, every week. Before we do that, I want to bless you. God, I just bless everyone who's here today. God, I bless every marriage, every parent, every relationship, every business. God, I pray blessing and favor over our health and our finances, God. And again, every relationship that we have. I pray that you would make yourself known, that you would make yourself evident in every dimension of our life. Bless us as we come and bless us as we go, and we will give you praise, God, in all things. In Jesus' name I pray. Everybody said, amen.